Linus Horx is in the business of examining what is not yet quite the case and analyzing trends. He says many Germans are too anxious and gloomy. What else can he tell us? This is a modern day prophet, Matthias Horx. In his latest book, Das Buch des Wandels, or The Book of Change, the renowned futurologist takes a trip into the past, to the hunters and gatherers of the Stone Age, to the extinct Mayan people, to the age of industrialization. Horx says the process of adapting to changed living conditions is by no means a disaster, but an important driving force behind evolution. In your new book, you say that our thinking influences the future. So what does that future look like? The future arises in our consciousness. Time and again there have been situations where people in history have brought about disasters by misguided perceptions of the future. The classic error is the apocalyptic error, a perception that is also widespread in Germany, that everything will get worse. Perhaps that's a warning to be taken seriously. Hork says this is why the Maya did not survive, because they worked themselves up into a state of fear and collective hysteria. In your book, you also write that it is especially difficult for Germans to envisage positive utopias. Why is that so? Because we've been historically traumatized by the events of the past century when we as Germans experienced a huge cultural collapse. We don't trust peace and we don't trust progress. As a collective, we don't actually have a concept of progress. But I think we can overcome this. And I believe that today we're in a position to develop a secular utopia. Not a naive, socialist, heroic utopia, but an idea of a society that should succeed classical industrial society. In the future, it won't be about manufacturing objects, but about manufacturing ideas. Horks sees the future in a positive light, despite climate change and social injustice. That earns him plenty of criticism. But he believes humankind will adjust, even if his ideas apply only to a small elite. In in terms of an evolutionary theory of the future, the ways in which we live together will also change. Can we already see this happening in our cities? How will our new social interaction be designed? What we can see today, what works in urban areas today, are two civic models. One is what's known as the neighborhood with a high cultural effect. There are many young families here living what is actually an atypical family model. The women aren't at home in the kitchen while daddy is out working all day and only comes home in the evenings. Instead, they move around in their own social networks. These are extremely vital centers in which something is working well. And then there is a movement that we've been able to establish mainly in southern Germany, what's known as co-housing. These are environmentally friendly estate projects where young and old live together, with reduced traffic volumes and solar panels on the roofs. This could be described as a new ecological bourgeoisie, starting to establish its own residential structures. Horx is currently building his own model for future living in Vienna, the Future Evolution House. With intelligent technology, lights can be dimmed by simply touching a wall, for example. The high-tech house will produce more energy than it consumes. That, too, is a trend. The house we are building is more modular in nature. For example, there's a module called love. That's for the couple, but taboo for the children. There's a module called think and work. That's an office because we work at home. We think that's where we're heading in the future. There's a wing called guests, that's for the children, to make it quite clear what the rules of the game are here. And there's a central module called hub, a living room that's also a kitchen. And this is quite crucial, there's no TV. Parks likes to point to Bhutan, where the key measure of development is not the gross national product, but gross national happiness. That takes educational prospects and satisfaction into account.
People change and are happy when they overcome challenges they've set and accepted for themselves. And this new question of quality of life became central to society long ago. I've also heard many people saying during the crisis, thank God it's over, this rat race, this constant drive to keep pushing up the GNP. To what extent will we sense something of this social change in 2010? 2010 will be the year in which we must draw conclusions from the crisis. And I have a feeling we're doing this very well, because we have to. The crisis is like a cold winter during which the weaker systems die and the strong ones will grow. We are in the middle of a major debate over education, which is not just about money. So I think we've learned from the crisis that the overstatement of purely economical criteria is in the end not good for society. In my view, this is something many managers have also learned today. So the apocalypse is not coming. To go extinct is pretty hard to do, and people are very robust and tough when it comes to change.